Um, so mostly what I'm going to talk about. Sorry, I'm just going to see if we can bump the volume up a little bit. Uh, so what I'm mostly going to talk about here is uh, AlgeWord, which uh, Oscar referred to, and really kind of talking from two real-world use cases, which are somewhat anonymized from exactly what we do in Twitter, mostly for simplification purposes. Um, and then how we use things in AlgeWord to allow those things to scale. So both of the things I talk about we will do, we do in both real time and batch. So it is, uh, they both run in something bird or something bird like systems here at Twitter. Um, so I basically uh, work a lot with Oscar. Basically, he dumps all his toys on me when he goes on to new things, and I write lots of code to keep them alive. That's generally what I do here, um, basically. So as I discussed, we'll talk to Hyperlog Log, which is approximate sets, and Countman Sketch, which is effectively approximate maps uh, for long values with certain restrictions on it. But um, and then basically, briefly, it'll be just exactly how easy it is. Oscar covered some of this, but discussing you know, the fact that some of these things are relatively complicated and writing them is a pain, optimizing them is all a pain, but now that it's all done for you, generally, people drop these things in on Twitter, and at this point, no one notices or cares exactly how complicated they are. They just treat them like a map. It just magically works. Um, so people compose these up into very big systems. And we have no idea. One, one of the kind of very interesting things is like I have no idea where most of my code's gone on Twitter. And you know, occasionally you get pinged by someone in a very distant department that somehow is n levels deep relying on our stuff, which is kind of nice about like the fundamental things like bijection and algebra that have just leaked all over Twitter stack, which is quite nice. And then lastly, one of the things we often get pushback from is exact. Um, so and kind of like why that's not really a thing. So I'll kind of cover that at the end, which is um, one of the big questions with everything to do with uh, approximate data structures is a lot of people say like, well, I want the exact number. And I'll cover that at the end, but basically the answer is most of the time you can never answer an exact number anyway. So this was uh, Obama's tweet uh, when he got reelected. Um, so this got retweeted almost a million times. Um, so pretty popular. And then take another one, which was uh, Ellen's selfie from the Oscars, uh, which you know completely destroyed Obama and retweets there. Um, so apparently you can tell what the world cares more about. Um, so standard problems we have for internal dashboards and some things that make it into product that people come up with is, is like as was mentioned, how many unique people viewed this tweet. So you know, kind of a very standard thing. Like if anyone views it 100 times or a bot does it, you clearly want to like wipe those things out. So certain things would spam for bots. But in general, unique users per tweet. And then often a common one is how many people looked at both tweets. So this allows you to identify like core users, more casual, and then overlaps with popular versus different types of categories of tweets. So standard naive approach, of course, would just be use sets. You know, set of longs for every user. Um, and then you know you start getting down to the numbers and it starts getting very painful very quickly, which is basically you know broad strokes, ten to the eighth of both. Clearly, that's you know take a lot of data, and be extremely slow. You know, try have a set that's ten to the eight elements and it's going to be tough fitting it in any memory. So, but basically, all you want for most of these answers is approximate set cardinality. Oftentimes, these numbers are so big, so approximate is like you can actually be reasonably fuzzy, and it's fine. Um, so hyperlog log is associated and commutative, which is very useful to allow and enable us to do all these algebraic data structures. So uh, a common thing of everything in algebra that we do generally is at least associative, um, which allows it to slot in. So the semigroup Oscar referred to. Pretty much everything uh, extends semigroup ultimately, which allows us to do these sorts of things, uh, just like drop it in. So like most of the methods we have in, for instance, Summingbird and Scalding, and a few more other places, all they do is they look for semigroups. They don't care what it is. They have a semigroup of type T. Uh, once they have a semigroup, they know how to combine it, and that's the important thing. Uh, in this case, the error is proportional to 1 over the square root of the size. So it's got like kind of like nice scaling properties. Um, so just kind of go through like an update step for it. So if you take it that your hyperlog log is a um, kind of an array of uh, bytes. So we want to update for value x. So start out, just hash it. And then you're going to split into two things. You have an array of these various fields. So first thing up, we just hash. So pretty much all of these things involve hashing in one or several times. 
So here, you're going to split it two times. So two ways you're going to use this then are in the first half of it, you basically pick your bucket with the first side of it. So you know, you're going to take the hash, you're going to, and then just uh, treat that as a number, modulate it down for the number of fields you have. And then you just use the number of leading zeros in the second half and then max that into that bucket, and you update the bucket. And that's pretty much the, just the update cycle. So we just do lots of these uh, when these things come in. And then the read side is pretty simple. It's a harmonic mean of all this sort of stuff. So this gives you an approximate of the totalized uh, cardinality of this set. Um, so this kind of gives you a notion of the errors that are involved. So the errors here at 2%. Um, for a 10 to the 9 set is 1.5 kilobytes of space, which is tiny. So in our case, that means we can do this for like every tweet. Um, and it only works out to be about 150 gigs per day, roughly uncompressed, which is tiny in the grand scheme of things. So the other main example, as I'm probably burning through these things too quickly, so um, is if we just take Spokane, just a random geo, taking like a popular thing, House cards, tweeting away. And then the problem in this case would be these sorts of questions. So these come up quite a lot, which is, and you want to know these generally quickly because they're using a dashboard and someone wants to for a report, which is standard things of like, um, how many times did someone view this tweet? But then start adding in extra constraints, like between certain hours, when do they view it? OK, that's not so bad. But then you start getting onto geo. So there's another dimension tossed in there. So how many um, views in Spokane that we had? Expanding that out is like, so you throw in another dimension, how many are in using uh, iPhone 6s? And then you end up with something like this, which is just our tuple there, where we have a tweet ID, a geographic location of some sort, a device ID, and the minute, if we want it per minute for accuracy. So when you start working that out for just looking at one month of storage, presuming you didn't have to go back too far for this, you start getting out of like about 10 to the 9 tweets per month, roughly. You've 10 to the 5 geos, 10 to the 2 devices, only about 100 of those you need to care about. And then 10 to the 4 minutely buckets. So you start getting up to pretty large numbers very quickly, which starts becoming a pain to both like store, query, update, and everything else to like do those aggregations, make them accessible. Um, and most of them are not going to be very interesting anyway. So Countman Sketch is a way to approximately look at uh, sorry. Uh, it's really a, a way to approximate look at that where your key, uh, your key is that tuple we looked at. And we basically want to know that value, but for the most part, um, we're, we're allowing some fuzziness is the standard thing. But it means that we can look this up extremely quickly. And that's the kind of trade off like Countman Sketch. So we use Countman Sketch extremely heavily. Um, because these properties tend to be very good. You want to know some number so you can keep it in memory um, and access a lot of data with a degree of fuzziness. Um, so Kalman Sketch, the data structure is basically stored as a matrix um, of longs, generally. Um, and basically, what you do is, so here you would be updating for x and y, where x is an arbitrary type, and generally y is a long, um, something you want to increment by, so standard kind of increment operation. Here it's a little different in that you have, um, for every row in that matrix, you have a separate hash function. Um, they don't need to be cryptographically secure. They just need to be separate hashes. So for each uh, hash function, um, on each row, we will use the value of that hash function and modulo your width to pick your cell, pick which column it should be. So pretty simple. And uh, sorry. And then finally, all you really do is you add y to each cell. Right? So you will have to make for every, so the expensive part here is you're doing a hash. So the more deeper your uh, countman sketch goes, the more expensive it is. So the more rows you have, the more hash functions you have to do, and the more updates you have to do. So it's kind of a trade off, whereas the width, on the other hand, you're only updating one of those at a time. Reading is really just the exact same process. You find all your locations to pull out, and then you just get the min of them all. So the constraint here of what it gives you is this, it's the minimum value it's going to be. So 
accurately, so as you can see from that update step, because we always add it in, and we're taking the minimum of all those things, we're guaranteed it can never be lower than our minimum. It may be higher, so hence the name. Um, so it can never be lower, which is kind of a reason constraint most of the time. So just kind of looking at the error here, presuming that we have, looking at an estimate x, just because there's a few algebraic things in here, so it makes sense to just kind of lay them out, which is like, if we do an estimate, estimate for our count for particular x, um, and the estimate's x, unfortunately, um, total count of the whole thing. So important one here is that the error is often, um, is proportional to the total count, which is the total number of things you've put into this count and sketch in total. Um, so if you have very little things in there, your error is very low. If you've really overloaded this count and sketch with a lot of data, then your errors will start spiking. So it's an important consideration as to how you size these things or sometimes when you cycle them out. So uh, often a lot of our cases, we will put a count and sketch as the value and your key could be, for instance, the hour or the day. Because you can combine these things up because they all have semigroups. So you can shard all this data as well. So you can combine just standard um, uh, cubing, data cubing with these sorts of approximate structures so that you can compound these errors in various cases. Um, so the upper bound, um, sorry, the, yeah, so we, we, we have the, um, the lower bound, that should be, resume. Um, Basically, yeah, unfortunate, but there you go. Uh, some math forms, but basically you have this kind of fuzziness around that thing. It's pretty low, you've got a reasonable probability within that thing. So in theory, so all you really get, you're getting a probability that it's within a confidence interval around there. So it could be much above it in a very extreme case, which is unfortunate when that occurs. But for, so we do have certain cases where these things matter where people will use these things as a fuzziness, and then we'll look up the exact and another data structure when it matters. So sometimes, so for instance, if you have dashboards that involve revenue, these things can provide you a very fast means to try to find the interesting things, and then we have secondary lookups that will go via slower paths and get you more accurate results when is required. So it's important to kind of notice the trade-offs, and people have been adding more alerts, and people have been burned here at Twitter. Like, approximate's brilliant until it isn't, and then, so it's one of the things you have to always be careful of your, the audience for your data and what the presumptions they make are. If someone presumes it's exact and it's not, you can run into problems and then, yes. I have a question about the, the scaling this data structure because as you have more hash functions, you move away from your optimal um, lower bound for the, the, the error. Uh, the increasing number of hash functions uh, gives you an increased confidence it will be within your error bounds. So the number of hash functions is part, it, it controls like the number of um, uh, the kind of uh, your, your confidence, your, your probability within being within your upper and lower bound, right? Is the number of hash functions. How big that bound is is then is based on the width. So the number of columns for each hash function controls the error. And then your probability of being within those bounds is based on the number of hash functions. But the more hash functions you have, the, the more likely that two pairs will have correlation between the functions that they choose. And the number of pairs you have is exponential the number of functions that you have. So with each bucket that you add, don't you actually increase the min? Yeah, so that's exactly it. You take the min. So when you're actually reading, they're all like effectively independent. You will only ever take one. So if you, have, if you collide across half of them, so in a very common case, for instance, you will, most of the time in a big one of these, you will collide in actually nearly all of them, right? And on a certain number of one of those, you may collide with very big things, which would throw your results way out. But as long as you don't collide with something much bigger than you on some of your results, so only on one row, in fact. If, if there's one row, so th this is the problem. If you look for something which is extremely low frequency, this thing is not, not a great, great data structure for that. Things that are like in very much in the tail with very low frequencies, you run into a lot of noise there. So if things are all like you know um, normal distribution, it's pretty good for. So because you only take the minimum though, it doesn't actually matter if you collide. So a very um, what would be there like if you uh, Ellen's tweet for instance, if you collide with that, the probability is you'll only collide with it once. Even if you collided with it twice, it wouldn't matter as long as there is a row where you're not colliding with something that will completely shroud your answer. But do you guys have a way of creating these hash functions that make it so that you don't 
for it, like each incremental addition hash function that you guys generate, you don't actually um, increase the chances of um, having more collisions? So, like the hash functions are independent, which is fine, not cryptographically secure, but collisions don't actually matter for that purpose. As in, like you may increase the probability. So let's presume like they're not um, you. The more hash functions, the more likely you are of more collisions. But because you only ever actually use the value from one row, that doesn't actually matter, as long as you didn't collide on every single one. So increasing the number of hash functions will never actually like increase your probability overall of complete colliding. It might increase, like obviously if you increase it like in infinitely, you will start colliding. But because you only pick out one row, you know, the, when you increase your number of rows, um, it, so your overall probability of having collision won't go up. Your prob sorry, your, your probability of having collision will go up, but your probability of having at least one non-collision won't change. Ian, this may help. I'm not sure if this is clear. Each hash function only writes to its own row, right? So you never have collisions between hash functions. You only have collisions between different keys on the same hash function. Make sense? OK. So in this case, so we do, we do a lot of kind of interesting things. In this case here, this would make 160 gig CMS without any compression to store all of this data which you can actually just store on a laptop. So sometimes for tech demos or various other things, it can be useful to actually just stick a very large CMS in there, and you can like, fake out a big data backend sitting on your laptop and be offline. So we have done like, various projects of just sticking huge volumes of data in, and then you can do uh, real-time exploration just sitting on a laptop, um, which allows you to like, super slice in various means, which is kind of nice. But in general, it mean, how we normally use these things is we will stick these things in the value somewhere. So you're subslicing different ways, and this gives you an extra degree of resolution that is not practical to count normally. Um, and you can see the. So the m most important thing really here is just exactly how easy it is to use all of these things. And they all report their errors when you use them, which is kind of useful. But the most important thing is then when you get down to it, so monoids, Oscar talked about, so we won't really cover that. Um, or commutivity, too much, unless anyone has any questions. Scalding, we'll skip. Sum by key, Oscar uh, alluded to this, but he showed group and sum. Sum by key is in all our projects now, which is actually one of the nicest things going. So as Oscar alluded to, you have this sum by key, which looks for an ordering. But the important thing here is that it requires a semigroup in V. So whatever V is. So often in our cases, V is a combination of hyperlog logs, count min sketches, inside a Scala tuple, possibly with a map, a set, and a lot of other stuff in there. So you have these huge things, and you just layer them all up, and then you just call sum by key. So these jobs end up looking kind of like very trivial, where thankfully all of this stuff is entirely gone away from the user. So um, the, the person who has to run the job that actually is producing that dashboard for someone doesn't ever need to care um, how these things should be aggregated or how it should be wired into one aggregation system or another. It's kind of the nice property of exposing semi-group everywhere has just meant that in both like online and offline terms, and like so, if you have a real-time query system system that has to do some calculations and return a result back to a user, those sorts of things, like all the same operations can just be picked up everywhere because they all have this nice semi-group thing. So hopefully the Spire stuff will all kick in there too. We get on to that. So to kind of give an example, so this is an actual um, tutorial thing we have sitting around somewhere. Um, and this is doing a count min sketch. So the first line is obviously an import. If anyone's familiar with Scala, wildcard import. And then we create an implicit monoid to make it available in scope. So often we do a lot of these things is we'll build up various implicits in scope for monoids and semigroups that are available. And then the the bulk of the code that's in there is generating just all the fake data. So this is actually just runnable as is. Um, and so the important thing really is the map, as Oscar was talking about. And you just basically map. So with an aggregator, you wouldn't actually need this map step often. You could just use the aggregator, and it would auto pick it up from the value. In this case, you do need it. If you're using map, if you're using sum by key, you would need it. So this is all you pretty much have to use to use a CMS. And that's it. At the end of it, the value will be this countman sketch that you can do lookups. 
And then this is kind of ones we run into a lot, um, less so over time, which is the desire to have it exact. Uh, most of the time, the less so over time is because the cost function of exactly how much this costs to Twitter to run these things is so much drastically lower that people like are willing to take it approximate. There's a whole bunch of cases where you can't do it, um, or certain algorithms don't work well in certain cases. But where you can, it's significantly cheaper, faster, and scales better. But also, like a big thing that comes down to it is, is that through various pipelines from what gets off your device from iOS, so anyone who's done iOS or Android knows that basically there's a huge amount of loss generally. You're not going to get all the events, you're going to get them multiple times, or you're going to get a lot of stuff coming off those devices. And that's even before it reaches your system. Now you're going to have outages in your log logging pipelines, your services, what they do or don't write. Eventually you reach Hadoop, you end up with corruption at a certain scale, you start having corruption and LZO starts kicking in, your various compression, your serialization, the whole world. So basically you end up with you know, uh, up to about 5% of your data is just corrupted or gone. So you may be getting repeats. You get all these various things. So at the end of the day, you don't really have an exact number. So trying to get an exact number out of Hadoop when your data input is not exact is kind of nonsensical. Well, it's totally nonsensical. So where the approximates can actually have a lower error bound than your inbound data pipeline, it makes no sense to just not use the approximate for the most part. Um, so one huge aspect for us at Twitter is with the CMS. Um, so the CS CMS algorithm comes with heavy hitters, which attempts to give you items that are in the CMS above let's, some arbitrary thresholds, like 1% of the data, it's like a ratio of the data. So it's kind of, so it's bounded. But often what we want is top N. Top N, unfortunately, is not actually associative, but it's close enough. Um, this one's used a huge amount for us. So, um, one of the big ones is, is if you go to a tweet on Twitter that's been linked to, so the Ellen Selfie and the Obama ones would both have this property, so that they're linked in by like a lot of news sites. So we can use these sketch maps to keep track of how many times we got refers from these external sites. Um, so this sketch map gives you an approximate means of do that. that. Because it's so cheap to do, we actually can just do it for every tweet. We have no notion of saying, when a tweet's created, we don't know if it'll end up in all various news media. But a huge amount of the sites that will be a refer to anything, we will never see again, and they won't be very interesting. We'll see one or two or three. So even though it's not associative, it will give you your top end where you know um, these are reasonably large. So if you want to look at inbound news sites for refers or similar things like that, it works extremely well for us. And that's actually what powers our related headlines system is a something bird topology that uses this. Um, so that's kind of like one of the associated things. Uh, one of the more recent things we did in our storehouse abstraction was um, in-memory caching. Um, so from our caches, be able to just use a CMS with these heavy hitters sitting around the place to decide what to cache and what to not. So one thing if you start getting into like the minutia of MapReduce is with these long tails, keeping them in the JVM in your cache um, if it's very infrequent, it's actually quite expensive for GC because it might make a tenure when it shouldn't. And it, so, but basically knowing that these percentage of things are like much more common means as you're streaming to huge amounts of data in your mappers, you can just discard things. So the same thing applies in like our stores and whatever else, which is that if I know this thing in map side combina combinators is very rare, I would definitely not want to cache it. I want to write it out immediately because I know there's not many of them. But the, anything that is like very common, we will cache heavily and attempt to not flush till the end of the mapper runs as much as possible. So these are kind of like various things we stick in. So we have these in various different systems and different forms. But just kind of using this approximate nature where most of the time you do not care about exact and best efforts good enough. So in summary, uh, we like our approximate data structures. We do them a lot, and we generally wire them into everything. They're not suitable for everything, and it's important to know when you start getting up, if you're presenting it in an important way, short of a dashboard, generally, where are the weak points for some of these algorithms? Because if you hit them, it can be like very misleading and kind of frustrating for your users. But they're easy, and we use them in sculling something where it and Spark, in fact, internally as well. So um, it kind of works every, well in everything. That's about it. Any questions? Are there any 
big difference in performance for uh, intersections or the mid hatch versus the hydrolog log? Oscar would probably want to have to know that. I've never run Minhash. Maybe Avi knows. I, I, we, we generally don't run code, to be honest. We, we, we build libraries. Um, it's like one of those like, distinctions at our size. Is like, where possible, we just avoid running it. <laughs> I think Avi brought the answer to that a little bit. Avi, maybe you want to answer that a little bit in your talk, or do you want to really try to answer it now? Because you probably thought, or, you know, we, we keep talking about this issue. It comes up over and over again. I don't, I don't, really, I don't want to push on the spot. Do you want me to say something about it? Yeah, you said something. OK, so, um, so intersections are really super hard. I think they're actually an open research problem for approximate data structures. So if you want to get the intersection, there's a, I don't remember what this rule is called, but there's some rule of like, you know, it's like logic or, or, or it comes up in a lot of ways, but you can compute the intersection if you compute the inter, if you have two sets, and if you know their size, and you know the size of their union, you can compute the intersection. And so algebra gives you a method to do this. Now the problem with this is the error compounds very fast. Unlike the error does not compound very fast when you have unions. So unions compose really nicely with a lot of these methods. Intersection, not so much. Now, back to intersections. Minhash doesn't give you the intersection. It gives you the ratio of the intersection over the union. So it gives you that Jacquard similarity. So you can combine a hyperlog log and a minhash and multiply, you know, do this kind of trick. Um, I think there's some interesting academic work that can be done on like how does the error scale there. But since we're all practitioners and maybe we, maybe maybe a lot of us got PhDs, but now we disavow them, um, we could just like run some simulations and see what the error is, and it would probably be fine. You know, probably just work. And uh, but I, there probably is a nice algorithm to get the intersections that people probably just have not found yet. There's one that I speculated about, but I couldn't prove anything about, and it's sitting in an open pull request on algebra. But I don't know. It's like it's a good question. Other questions? What does 138 mean? <laughs> My name, then ASCII. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>